Timing and Synchronization In our previous videos, we successfully configured all the components necessary for the two nodes to communicate using IP MPLS. The next step is to configure the packet-based timing protocol that will be used to carry the synchronization information between the two ends of the pseudo-wire. This protocol is known as Precision Time Protocol, or PTP version 2, and is also known by its standardization number, IEEE 1588. For both nodes, a separate loopback interface is the device that PTP will use. Often, the specific loopback interface number, 1588, is used as a convenience, purely to indicate the purpose of this interface. Once a loopback address is selected for PTP, it must only be used for PTP. Next, we need to configure some general global options for clocking. The first command specifies that the automatic clock selection process from the ITU G781 standard is to be used. Generally, this is the required option. Next, we specify quality level or QL enabled mode. This option means that quality level is to be considered when choosing a clock source, as well as the other two parameters, clocking availability and the priority with which it's configured. In QL disabled mode, on the other hand, quality level is not considered. Again, most circumstances require QL enabled mode, so that's what we'll use here. If there's a failure of the primary clock and the router switches to a backup clock when the primary clock is restored, this command will tell the router to revert back to using the primary source. Most circumstances require this behavior. The final global option is to specify which type of network we'll connect the router to. In this example, we'll use an ITU standard network. Consequently, the TDM interfaces are E1, so we'll configure SSM option 1. If the router is to be connected through T1 to an ANSI standard network, then we'd configure option 2. Clocking inputs and outputs. Next, we'll consider the TDM circuits, which will be further configured later. For now, we're just considering clocking and synchronization. Notice that router blue is the clock master in this scenario, as symbolized by the clock icon. The remote site, attached to router red, is taking the clocking from the site where router blue is installed. It's normal that remote sites take their clocking from devices closer to the core. We must reflect these facts in the configuration. So, first we consider the remote location where the circuits are attached to router red. In this remote location, the clocking is delivered from router red to the TDM equipment. To achieve that, we must configure clock source internal for both the TDM circuits. Meanwhile, in the central location, the router blue is receiving the clocking from the TDM equipment. Therefore, we configure the clocking to be line. Finally, since router blue needs to select the clock coming from the TDM network, we configure the E1 controllers to do that. Depending on the customer facilities, the router may instead be clocked from a local bits source. See the configuration guide for information on this alternative. Note that the greater than sign in the slides indicates a line continuation. The actual command is network clock input source 10 controller E1 0 slash 1 slash 0 all on a single line. Define PTP slave and master ports. To transmit the synchronization from blue to red, we configure the PTP between the sites. One end will be a PTP ordinary master and the other an ordinary slave clock. Since the clocking information is being sent in the direction from blue to red, the router blue will be the PTP master and red will be the PTP slave. Please be aware that the router blue will require a valid 1588 master license to be configured as a master, whereas the slave function only requires the standard IP MPLS license on router red. We configure both the master and the slave using the same general command structure. The domain number must agree between the master and the slave. 
It's very important to configure the appropriate clock priority from the master and the slave clocks. Note that the priority of the master, 100, must be lower than the priority of the slave, here, 200. In PTP, a lower value means a higher priority. Now we define the slave function. Note that the loopback 1588 interface is configured here for PTP. Once this command is input, the loopback 1588 address will not respond to a ping. Next, we specify the IP address of the master PTP clock with which this router will synchronize. This is the loopback 1588 address on router blue. Finally, we configure router red to select its clocking input from the PTP slave clock we've just configured. Remember, we configured the TDM circuits to take their clocking from the internal device. Here, we set the internal device to take its clock from PTP. As a result, our TDM circuits will be synchronized with the master clock running on blue. This command may not be accepted on earlier versions of iOS on router red, but PTP clocking will still sync automatically and function correctly. Similarly, we configure the PTP master on router blue. Note that it's not unusual to take up to 30 minutes for the slave to successfully sync with the master. Confirming 1588 synchronization. We now confirm that the 1588 synchronization is running correctly. There are three basic steps to confirming that the clocking is working correctly from end to end. First, the PTP clocks on both routers should be exchanging packets and the PTP slave should show as being locked to the master. This command shows the configuration of the clock selection priorities and their status. The router red should show PTP as its selected clock master, and the router blue will show the inputs from the TDM circuits. Finally, we check the E1 controllers to make sure that the circuits on router red are clocking through the internal local oscillator, while those on router blue are clocked through line.